right, so welcome everyone. So I'm Rick Duell. I'm at the School of Communication Information here at Rutgers, teaching professor, and I run the graduate program, my master's in communication media. So I've been teaching online since 2003. I've had the scars to prove it. Uh, I also did one, full, one of my master's fully online. I did one in a hybrid. I did my doctor in hybrid. So I have the student side as well. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about what we call this dialogue uh, intensive model. We actually designed this and started using it at Seton Hall. I was at Seton Hall for 14 years before I came to Rutgers a couple years ago. And we kind of pioneered it there in a graduate master's program. And that's where it kind of took off. So I have a point of view. You know, just understand right away my bias is towards this model. Doesn't mean the other models aren't good or, or, or appropriate. You know, I understand uh, you know, the uh, academic freedom and a different uh, pedagogy. I happen to believe in this one for reasons that will come quite apparent. Be, feel free to argue with me and debate. I'm very happy to go through it with you. Uh, so you can tell by the heading, that's actually a real class I had. So the program I ran at Seton Hall was a mid-level leadership and communication program, mid-career people, and we had an eclectic group. So this is one, I've had nuns, I've had many military officers, I've had entrepreneurs, I've had nurses, doctors, you name it. It's kind of an interesting group. Obviously the whole point of an online class is the discussion. We all know that's where the learning takes place, and it makes a difference. It, makes, it completely changes the student's experience, depending on how that goes. And obviously we all know that. And the only point I want to make in this one is I really do consider it a living organism. There's no one right way to do it. There's also no one right way to do it in a class. And the way I teach mine is I shift it all the time. So I don't do the same discussion structure 15 straight weeks because that just bores the students out. It gets a bit relentless. We'll talk about that a little bit. And obviously, uh, I think peer-to-peer -peer learning or student-to-student -student learning is a good, rich experience. That's part of the reason why we use this model. Um, and obviously, you all know this, but it will dramatically eclipse any on-campus instruction or interaction. Not, it's not even close. And there's plenty of research on this. I'm sure you all know that, so I don't need to bear with it. What's based what's on this dialogue intensive model, though, the thing we ratchet up dramatically is the student-student interaction. Doesn't mean that we're sitting on the sideline, far, far be it. We're in there seven days, I mean, sometimes seven days a week, mostly five days a week at Rutgers. We're in there constantly. <laughs> but I'm in there maybe 30, 20, 30 percent of discussion posts, and the students are 70 percent. And a lot of that student, student, not so much reacting to me. So I'll take you through that as well. So here's, I'm going to give you a few quotes. Obviously, the point of this is you learn from each other, but it means you have to you get you have to get the students contributing. They got to be giving you their opinion, their experience, their anecdotes, their sources. You know, they got to be willing to debate. They got to be willing to add sources. They got to be engaged to make this work. If you get a lot of me too, that's wonderful. I agree, kind of stuff. It kind of peters out, and I'll go through that a little bit. But they got to be actively involved. And obviously, you know, they're going to get more interaction from people's backgrounds the more they share. So there are a few models out there. We actually did a bunch of research on this when I was at Seton Hall. There's no correspondence courses anymore. I'm just showing you back in the early 1900s. This all started way back then. Uh, but there's three models that we looked at. These aren't the only models, but these are three models we researched. We have what's called the Q&A model. Instructor posts a question, you answer it. Done. You're done with the discussion. Then we have what's called the one plus model. You have to do an initial posting respond to some number of peers. In some cases at Rutgers, it's a lot of times post your 500 word posting on Thursday, respond to two peers by Friday. I don't happen to believe in that model, but that model is used a lot. Uh, and then we have the dialogue intensive model, which I'll show you. Now, an interesting dilemma for me right now when I'm running the master's program, I have a student right now in two different online classes this semester. One using the dialogue intensive model, one using the one plus. She's totally confused. And she's saying, what should I do? How come these aren't the same? Why aren't I getting the same experience? And you can, I mean, obviously I can tell you the one she's not happy with. All right, so, but I have to explain to her, hey, just like you have to adjust different bosses, you're going to adjust to different environments. All right, and that's the way it is. But it just gives you a contrast. It's becoming a problem for us because too many of our faculty in our school use the one plus model, and only a couple of us use the other model, and that's a contrast. It's pretty interesting. Obviously, that line is supposed to show you what discussions look like, and I'll show you some numbers on that. So I'll go through these three. Has anyone ever seen a different model than these three? Another model that you've seen out there before that's quite used? I mean, these are broad categories, but, or you've just seen iterations of these, typically. And yeah, that's what I see typically as well. So I try to capture it for you. So in the Q&A model, obviously, you know, to me this is really lazy on the instructor's part. 
In fact, she just used it at the keynote at the lunchtime. You post a question on the readings and you sit back and wait for people to respond. In this case, the student only has to respond to the question. And that's it. There's literally no dialogue. And I don't know why we even use this model. Why do we call it a dialogue-based model? Because there is no. There is none. But it is used out there. And obviously there's no student interaction. There's not even any bookends on the faculty. They'll say, okay, in response to this question, but they won't do a recap at the end. They won't kind of bring it back to learning points for that week. So even if you did that, I could see it has got some value because you synthesize a little bit for the students so they can get some value out of it. I don't even see that. So it's just an opening and then you're silent for a week. But that model, unfortunately, not at Rutgers, at least not in our school, is not used. Uh, and obviously it's only real, the only value is you've got proof that they did the reading. Okay, well, that's, that's going to be pretty boring for most students. Um, now, the one plus model, unfortunately, again, I'm, I have a point of view, so please argue me if you disagree. This is used by most of our instructors at our school. I'd say about 70% of teach online use this model, 30% of us use the other model. And here's an example. This is literally out of a class going on right now. Now, if you think about it from the student perspective, all right, so they have to post, first of all, 500 words is long. That's a page and a half. Think about reading it. 22 people in this class, and you've got to sift through 22 page and a half postings. There's no way there's value in that. You're going to pick up any two, maybe your friend or someone you liked before, and you're going to respond to that. So I don't see any value in this personally, but this is used. And then what's really bad is you respond this on Thursday, which means essentially, okay, let me know what you think of two other ones on Friday or Saturday. All right, well, there's no discussion then. It's just, it's a rote, I'm going to respond. Now, right now, as I said, this is going on quite a bit. Now, it's got some promise, and, and, and there is one instructor in our school that does okay with this. She does a bookend. She says what's up going on on a Monday. She'll say, this is what I want you to do. And she'll come in on Saturday and kind of bring it all together with learning points, on Sunday, part of the learning points. Okay, there's some value there. And she'll even comment on some of, this, you know, some of the students' responses. Even though she doesn't expect the students to respond more than two, she will. So she does bring some value to that, and she does kind of bring it alive to them. The question is, are students even paying attention by Sunday? Are they even reading her response? No, they're on to the next week, because Monday's the next week, the next session. So we could argue about whether this one's got real value or not, uh, but I, I wanted to show you an actual posting in her class. Now, in our model, the model that I'm arguing for today, it's very active. You're in there Monday to Friday. All right, and there's a lot of student-student interaction as well as student-to-faculty uh, interaction. All right, and the whole point of it is we're trying to extend the discussion. So there's one single discussion question, not multi-parted. There's literally one. The other thing I put in there is you do not have to do the readings to respond to the question because I don't want to give students an excuse. Well, do the readings first, then respond. That's Wednesday. Well, no, I want them responding Monday. I want them in right away. So I, I make sure I craft a question on the topic for the week but you don't just have to do the readings. But then what we ask them to do is bring in your personal experiences, your personal ex examples. Ask a question, give us an anecdote, debate the point. You need to extend the conversation. You can't just respond, your obligation student is to respond and extend. That's the framework we set for this, and that's the tone that we set as we go through it. And then the other point I want to make on this one is, that initial question uh, sets the foundation, but as faculty, and I'll show you this later, you have to be ready to facilitate and go in different directions. So I'll use the word flex there. We'll go down rabbit holes, we'll go off on tangents. If it's relevant and, and if the students are engaged, we can see it and we'll keep it going. Anyway, everyone work in Canvas? Okay. You use Canvas as a, okay. I personally hate Canvas for the discussions. I love Canvas in general, but not for discussion, because the way it lays out, it's very, visually it's not as conducive like Blackboard and others are. So it's kind of hard to see the threads, but you can follow it. I mean, you can eventually get there. But in other models, like in Blackboard, you can actually see the, the tangents. So it makes this flexing a little easier. Now, we can make it work in Canvas, but it's not quite as, as intuitive. So the idea behind it is they extend the materials. So here's some examples. So this is a 10-student class, discussion units one week. And these aren't actual numbers. This is for visual representation. I'll show you the actual numbers in a minute. But this is typically what happens. You're going to see sometimes it's more like 50%, like 50-50, or sometimes a little higher, you know, you know, 2 to 1, sometimes 3 to 1, discussions here versus this model. Now, not quite because it depends on what they do with the 1 plus model. So what I'm seeing at Sky is a 50-50, I mean a, a 2 to 1. And we'll see double the amount in discussion-based course versus a 1 plus course. That's the numbers we're doing. I'll show you. I have an example of this one to show you. So here's a winter intercession course. And this is an anomaly. It's three and a half weeks. So obviously it's intensive by definition. 
But you can see the numbers here, 164, 163, 223, 244 postings in a week. In this particular class, which is my class, there were 21 students. So that's a lot. I mean, 223, so that's a really engaged class. Now, why did I drop down? Because I realized they're going to burn out in four weeks. So I restructured the discussion in weeks three and four. Where I said, okay, take Monday off and reflect on this and come back in. Or let's break it into two parts. So I deliberately changed it. It's not like they lost interest and they lost momentum. I just restructured it here so they didn't just burn out completely. And now that just gives you one. I'll give you, this is the 15-week course. This is actual, this is one going on right now. This is out of my course as well. Just to give you an idea, and you can see here, you know, 168, 132, 75, 140, you know, 142. This is a pretty intensive week because that was two sections actually. We broke the week up. So it's 142 and 81. So you're talking about 230 postings in a week. Same thing here. This is three segments. So you can see it's fairly intense. And you can't, what I always tell students, and I tell faculty, you do not want to miss a day. Because you get that, that feeling in the pit of your stomach when you go in the morning and there's 45 postings from yesterday. Now you already feel like you're behind and lost and there's stress there. So I always tell people, I, I personally go in twice a day. I try and keep it palatable. If I see 20 or 30, I can deal with that. If I see 50, oh, now i got to catch up. That's not great. All right, but this gives you an idea what it looks like. Now this is the one plus model. Now this is the one where, this, where the faculty member, she bookends it and does some synthesis at the end. So you can see it's not terrible. She's got about half what the other class has, just a little slightly under half, but still pretty good engagement. I think there's 17 people in this class, so not bad at 90, 70, 65, et cetera. So it's, it's a good, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize it, but it's a different dynamic. The way, but what you don't see when you look at this is, most of them, like for, I, I picked one week, I think it was week five I picked, yes, it was week five. Of those 90, 70 of them were Thursday to Sunday. There's no way you're going to get any value out of that. There's no way the students are reading all that stuff in three days, especially on a weekend. So again, it looks good on paper, but in practice, not quite getting the engagement that I, I think we want. So good so far? Anyone okay? Yes, please. Traditional, non-traditional, what's the split of kinds of students? To 60 percent are... Yeah, 60% of our students work full-time, so they're, they're non-traditional in that sense. Uh, and then we also have 25% are Chinese, because we're an international cohort. They're, in, they're mixed here. So we've got a few different dynamics going on here. Yeah. And when you break it down further, that gets really interesting. Yeah. Um, we've seen a lot more, more intensive dialogue than students who are working creates great anxiety and yeah. more than the students who are working creates great anxiety. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I should point out that, um, uh, yeah, this is the one. This is my class. You'll notice that I deliberately changed the format here. So I broke up the week. And I'll one second. And like this, this past week, before we went to spring break, they had no Monday discussion and they had no Friday discussion. I want to kind of get into, into um, spring break. And I only, we did something kind of now or Tuesday to Thursday, trying to break out the momentum. It does get relentless after a while. Yes, ma'am. So this is graduate school. Yes. So I totally agree with this from a pedagogical point of view. but. Do you think that you could get undergraduates in, say, first and second year undergraduates to do this? Yes, I, I do, because I teach undergrad courses, too. I just haven't used my grad course. Oh. And I do. I don't get 200 in a week, of course okay. not. All right, But I'll, do, I'll get over 100 routinely. Now, it's very much like she said at lunchtime. you got to get their interest, and you got to put something that's got value. And you got to be in there. I'll talk about your part in the middle. you got to be in there facilitating, kind of pushing. you got to set the expectation. I'll go through that. Could you tell us what expectations you convey to the students? Yep, good coming up. Okay. There's a rubric and a lot. So, all right. So we actually did uh, a research project at, at Seton Hall on this. Now it's not the it's not the most uh, scientific you ever saw in your life. All right, but it gave us something to look at. We tend we picked off on the comments. I mean, not on their actual Likert scale things. But we picked off on the comments. We thought the quality of the comments might be more indicative of their experience. And so we looked at 80 students from each model. So those three models over the course of a year and a half. This is 12 through just before, actually a little longer, almost to 14. And 67% um, of them happened to come in the dialogue, they had experience with dialogue and test model, because that was kind of our program, unfortunately. So that was there. 29% of the 17% tend to be the other master's program and a couple undergrad programs at Seton Hall. So again, one school, year and a half kind of time frame, qualitative comments about, this, about the discussions. Uh, the result of it was pretty mixed in the one plus q and I mean, some students were positive, but far more were negative or didn't care. But the ones who are positive, they tend to make comments about the workload. The workload was manageable. 
it wasn't that bad. You know, I don't consider that necessarily a positive comment from my perspective, but for their perspective, that was good. They thought it was positive. And then the dialogue intensive model, you've got a lot more positive comments when we looked at it. And these are just examples, some of the quotes that kind of capture the tone for you. I love that first one because it does become kind of the thing you do each week. It gets into your kind of into your bloodstream. You want to do this once you be really engaged. If you get the students in a proper place, they, they're into it. At least most of them, yes. Would you be able to give us an example of the sort of prompts? Like what, what sort of questions you're posting for them to I think I might have a, I, I can tell you. I think it might come, yes sir. What other uh, workload do you have during the week? <laughs> Quizzes, uh, reading we don't, materials, uh, so papers? So it's a regular graduate class that mirrors the on-campus course. So there's usually five graded assignments and there's readings every week. And there's sometimes videos every week. So it's, it holds up to graduate scrutiny or graduate rigor. Uh, and then we spread them out, of course. Now, I'll show you in a minute. We really weight discussion. It's 20, usually 30%, no less than 20. So we weight it, and I'll show you that in a second. So again, this just kind of captures some of that qual qualitative feedback we had. So let's get into the detail now. How do you make this all work? Oh, yes, sir. Sorry. Um, I just had a question. Uh I guess sort of big picture. I'm an instructional designer and yep. part of my job, well, the biggest part of my job is promoting the benefit of models like this to sure. faculty. Sure. And one thing that it seems to me is you're not talking about just about student engagement but also about instructor engagement. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked by instructors if there's a way that the post once replied twice can be automatically marked so they don't even have to read the post. And I can just see the look of horror spreading across their face as I say, you're in there every day. You're going to have 50 responses by noon. How do you, how have you address that with your faculty to, to you show can, them that? Just, if you can come, I'll cut to that if you don't mind. Perfect, yeah. We'll get to that, so. All right, so let's just get a few things going. Um, with the first question, or the question was just asked, setting expectations. Our syllabi are quite detailed, and we specifically talk about the notions of quantity, quality, and timing around discussions. In our syllabi, there's literally two and a half pages just on the discussion of what we expect. We're very clear about this. And we also have rubrics. I'm going to show you an example. So we tell them, here's what an A plus posting looks like, A, a posting looks like. Here's what the, quali the quantity, because they always want to know how many. That's inevitably, even graduate students ask that. We'll, sh we'll show them that. And then we talk about timing. If you do everything on Thursday, who cares? And the discussion ends on Friday. Now, in my classes, I kill the discussion on Fridays at midnight. But I don't let it bleed into the weekends. I got to let them time off because it does get relentless when you saw 200 postings in there. So we do. I happen to weight them all at 30 percent. All right, but some pack could go down as much as 20. And we grade every discussion unit. All right, so we give them comments. Now the way I do it is, you know, you're going to get you did fine, great, carry on, keep doing it, and I really like that. Or you got to pick it up. It's like one or two sentences, but it just gives them some momentum, gives them some feeling they're okay because silence doesn't work. Now, I, when I, was, I learned my, my mistake, when I say to them, if you don't hear from me, you're doing fine, that doesn't work. They still want to know the comments, so I, I'll tell them that. And obviously, there is a um, big issue here between theory and practice and knowing and doing. You've got to translate a lot of this stuff, so we use a lot of practical things. So I will say, bring a work experience in. Bring an example in. Bring another source. You know, it could be an academic source or professional source. Create a scenario. Ask us what we would do in this case. Ask me a question. Debate. So we try and get them to translate this the practical stuff, kind of learn it tonight, apply it tomorrow kind of approach. It keeps them engaged. And then obviously we'll talk about this guy. I'm sure you all do this already on tone and etiquette. I'll show you some of the student behaviors we see and some, some places you've really got to intervene. And then obviously there's a poster rubric which I'm going to show you. So as I mentioned, we do, we're very clear about quality, quantity, and timing in our syllabi. And then so, for example, this is an example that you have to do a minimum of seven posters over four days. So, if it's a five-day uh, dialogue week, you've got to be in at least four. And it can't be, you know, or, you know, or don't come in on Thursday and Friday. So, we were very clear on that as an example. And then we have a grading scale, and we're very specific about two. Now, we also specific about too many. And I'll talk about that student behavior in a minute, because you're going to get the one that posts 30 times in a week, and that's really disruptive as well. So, then we show them what a good posting looks like, right? And so this is a definition. Now this is meant for the initial posting to the first question, not for subsequent. I give them a hard time if I get three paragraph responses Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because you can't read through all that. I try to teach them clear and concise. It's a dialogue. One, two sentences. 
It could be paragraph at most, once you get past your initial post. All the initial posts showed me is you understood the question and you did a little bit of homework. That's great. Now let's take it from there. And what I do is I'll go through those initial posts and try and pick some themes out and I'll now post another question related to it, try and keep the, the discussion going. And then we go through this one all the time. You know, I agree, you're wonderful. You know, they're great for morale and they're useless for discussion. And I will be immediately on the students that do that. I right, say, so that's one, that's good, you got, you got your one, I agree for the week, you're done. Now let's extend it. I agree, but, did you think of that? Or I agree, and. So I always say, I agree, and, I agree, but. That's what I want them to do, so extend the conversation. And then here's again, what a great, this is, a, this is out of the actual rubric, and you can see the parts. So that's a really good initial posting. And that's got four or five parts to it. You do all that, you got it, that's an A-level initial posting. That's great, that's what we're kind of looking for. So it's really hard for them to debate with me because it's pretty clear what we're expecting and when we're expecting it. Now, this is one that's got some controversy. We could argue about this one a little bit. They demand to know quantity, whether I, tell, whether I care or not. Now, this is not, this is Seton Hall's. This is not Rutgers. This is too many for Rutgers because we have too many students typically in classes here. So if you had 18 A-level posts, you're going to build your hair out of some facility. You're going to have 250, 300 postings in a week. That's way too much. I just want to give you an example. Now here's the other thing here. You see this point here? Now this is graduate school. It's different than undergrads. All right. I don't want a lot of source-based postings. I want practical too. I want that balance of theory and practice. So maybe 30% would be source-based with a proper you know, citation there. The rest are bring your personal experiences, bring your preferences, bring your insights to it. It's about what you think too. And we always, we always assume it's meeting the quality and we also tell them what the week is. Now, this, remember, this is a Seton Hall example. They started their weeks on Friday and ended them on, on Wednesday. Weird. I don't know why we did that. Here it's Monday, Friday. So I'm just giving you an example for one. And then we always put something in. They're trying to remind them, don't get behind. Now, the reason Seton Hall used this model is they gave them Friday, Thursdays off, and Thursday was reflection night, where you had to post a two-paragraph reflection on the week. Kind of pause and think back, student, what would you get out of it? I actually do that in my classes, but I require it on a weekend. So one of the graded assignments is a reflection posting, one posting, no discussion, no more than two paragraphs on the weekend. What'd you get out of the week? Now the way we do, the reason I do that is two reasons. One, it makes them step back and think of the week, kind of cleanses that week out of the head and not get ready for the next week. And it also tells me that they actually got this, this, the themes out. Because if I see 17 posts with the same themes, okay, that was a good week, I kind of talk, okay. If I see 15 different perspectives, okay, I screwed up someplace. Because how come they got all these different perspectives, right? So that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. It's very good for us to learn what's, what's resonating with them. So I tend to use that, but that's not part of the, the, the dialogue. That's a model to have it I've used. Uh, it is also, again, I'm showing, this is right out of the rubric, just to show you again. So this is what we're talking about quantity now. All right, so it's not just about, you know, if you post 18 times, but it's all, you know, you know, now we use, we use the term conference there. You don't say a whole lot. That's not an A level. You're not going to get an A if you're doing 18 without the quality. That's the first point. And you also can't make them up. You'll find students try and make it up on Saturday or Sunday for the week. No good. Midnight Friday, it closes. Done. Sometimes 2 in the morning, depending if we have international students. But we don't take them after that. You know, you can post them in there, but I'm not counting them. All right, so yes? How are you keeping track of how many each student posts? Canvas has got an analytics tool right in. It's pretty easy, actually. If you look at the left-hand pane, it says course analytics. Mm -hmm. You can dive into each student and see what they're doing. So you just check and assign Yeah, because I, I, I've got a sense of quality because I've been in this discussion. I'm in there, I'm kind of crazy. So I'm in there five days a week. I'm looking all the time. But then I can look at quality, on um, quantity and when by using analytics. But you can, if you, if you have, 12 students, you can pick up the pattern pretty quickly anyway. You can sense, as you all know, they can't hide in the discussions, right? So here's another one. Uh, this is the one where Mary, I totally agree. Now, I'm showing you this one for two reasons. One, this is an I agree post, and two, there's a little personal therapy going on, which I'm going to talk about in student behaviors in a minute. All right, so, um, so that what we tried to show them is, okay, that's nice. That was nice teaming and good feeling and good morale building, but you could have taken that and done something much different with it. So we gave an example, okay student, thank you for doing that, here's how you could have extended it. So again, we try and give them examples where they can do this as they go through. All right. And then the other thing which always rarely happens early, usually by the third or fourth week we'll start seeing this, but they're afraid to debate, especially with me. And I'm encouraging them, argue with me. In fact, I'll, sometimes I'll deliberately put a stupid or a comment in there just so he's going to argue with me. I'll deliberately try to be provocative and then I'll say, okay, I know that was dumb, but why did you argue with me? 
So I'm trying to get them to, you know, this is a risk-free thing. You can debate with each other. It's okay. Just be respectful. So we always put this in the rubric as well. And usually by the third or fourth week, we'll get a handful. I'll start doing that. Maybe by halfway, we'll get a few more. Never get more than a few. You know, if you maybe not even half, typically we'll do it. Uh, and then, um, whoever asked the question before, the initial question is pretty critical. So what I've learned not to do first, you can't have multiple part questions. You can't have question one, two, and three, and you can't have you know, a paragraph of questions. You need one single question, usually not more than a sentence. Maybe two if you really need to elaborate. So we, need, and we, we keep it generic. It's on the topic, but it's open-ended enough that you don't have to do the reads, you can jump in. You can have an opinion or experience pretty quickly. Now it's better if you, you know, when it'll get more enriched with the experience once you've done the reading, but we always build it so that you can jump in right away and, does, and also it doesn't have a, 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 specific, I mean, a, a specific response. It allows for multiple things. Now, I don't know if I actually put an example in, uh, but I can tell you when I have a current class in a minute. All right, so let me actually back up for a second. So I don't have oh, time we got. We still got a little bit of time. Okay, so far? Anything that's, that makes sense? All right, so an example you know, of, of, of a question. So last week, I'm teaching a course in project management. We're talking about the best way to staff project management teams. So my opening question was, okay, in your experience, how have the project teams been staffed in your organization? That's literally the question. Now, it's, it's on the topic, but I'm asking them to give me what, show me what, what happened in your experiences. All right, and then we take it from there. So it's that guy's in, so it's, they don't have to do the reading. Just if you had this experience, what were they? And you, I, I'm sure you can figure out the answer, right? Well, I knew the answer is going to be it's usually convenience based or someone appointed, and we know what the typical answer is, but then you take it from there. That led to 170 postings on that simple question. With how many students? With, with, with uh, I think there's 21 in that class. Now, the reason it led so much is because some people brought experiences, and then we took those experiences. Other people, like I put in a debate, okay, I know you said this, that's an ideal situation, what happens really? And so I'll argue a little bit, and I'll say, okay, I know you want to say that's true, but it's really more convenient, it's like it was around. But I mean, it was a pretty rich discussion on a simple, literally, it was about 12 words in the discussion question. So there is a bit of art to the way you build, build that discussion question, and you'll learn that over time. I've learned, I, and I, I watch colleagues, and I made the same mistake, I have a three-part question, that fails almost every time. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I have part one, they'll have part three, someone on Thursday has part one again, you get lost. All right? Now, it does demand that we stay engaged you know, as we go through that. Um, I think I've got this one, yes. Okay, so you got the points on this one. Now, I'm going to be completely you know, transparent here. I'm sure you already figured this out. This is very demanding from our standpoint. I mean, you have to be in there no less than four days a week on a Monday to Friday. I think you have to be in all five, personally. And I'm in all five, all right? Every day I'm in there, twice a day usually. All right, now I'm not suggesting everyone has to do that. I am a bit crazed about this stuff. I get it. All right, but we're the source of energy. And we're definitely the boundary controls. We're the facilitator. I mean that writ large. So we typically, I typically book in the course, okay? Here's what we're doing this week. So my discussion question says, okay, in the last three weeks we did this. Now we're coming on to this. So I give them context. I post the question. And then at the end of the week, they do their reflections. But I'll do a, I'll do a, a bookended posting on Friday night, usually Saturday morning. Okay, here's the key themes that came out. Now, why do I do that? Just gave them, I just gave them a head start to their own reflection posting, which they always appreciate. But I also kind of captured everything for myself. It's really not that, that hard to do it. It's only a paragraph or two, typically. It gives me a chance to look at it. The reason I say you're in five or six days, at Scene Hall, we were, it was a, a six-day week, online weeks. Again, at Rutgers, in my class, it's five days, yes. So I know they asked you before about uh, the other teaching uh, activities that you do. But uh, as far as content goes, is it just based on the readings that the students do, or is there also a lecture delivered online? There's a PowerPoint. In my case, I put a PowerPoint in, or I'll put a, a voiceover lecture. There's almost always a YouTube video of some sort and some readings. So it's a typical graduate course, and all those elements are there. And we'll weave those in you know, as we go through. Like, for example, I might say on Tuesday, and by the way, I know she said this, our, our author this week made that same point. But did you notice on the video? So I'll try and weave that in a little bit. Because I'm the same. See as Kyle, I'm also an instructional designer, trying to figure out how to present this to faculty where they're not going to balk. Oh, well, they're going to balk. This is a lot of work. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. Once you get into it, though, it's such a fulfilling experience, but it's a lot of work. I'm not trying to sugarcoat that at all. You know, so we're in there a lot, obviously, and I'll talk about the roles of the instructor. But there's also different styles. This also throws the instructors off because a lot of instructors have one style of, of doing this. That doesn't work. 
Well, I've learned over years, over years of doing this, is I have to actually be kind of a chameleon, and I have to adapt a little bit. So I might use the Socratic method. I actually use that quite a bit. All right. Well, I'll pose a question, sometimes deliberately annoying question or you know the provocative question, uh, and I'll be a devil's advocate. Yeah, okay. But have you thought about this? Well, what about that? I'll deliberately try and get some debate going. Unfortunately, what the students want is more of the expert part because they're hiring you, they're taking your course because they're expecting you to bring your expert opinion. So I always, I personally struggle with this is I do too much of this and not enough of this, so I always got to get that balance right because that's what they want. And sometimes they'll just they'll come right at So I'll give you an example. We're talking about uh, project manager failures. And okay, Dr. Dole, you've been doing this for a lot of years. Give me your worst failure. So they'll, they'll ask me a direct question. Well, I have to now give the expert opinion, which is great. I, I appreciate that. So I have to get that balance right. But a lot of instructors like a one model one approach fits all kind of thing, and that just doesn't really work. Because I also, I think you notice, you'll know this, each class has got its own personality, depending on the mix of students. They also have their own discussion personality. Some are early starters, and by Monday morning, by noon, you have 40 postings. Sometimes you don't get 40 postings until Tuesday night. You have to kind of react to, this, to the, the group that's in that room. In my case, I have a lot of international students, so I have a big Chinese cohort. They're always going to be later, and they're going to be very careful because they're worried about second language and what they need, looking bad, et cetera. So you have to make those kind of adjustments. So having, being adept at a few different styles actually helps the process better you know, once you're good at it. Then we got this superficial, which I've already talked to, I already talked to this point already. So I'll always point out, usually privately, so okay, I appreciate what you did, but your wonderful postings really aren't helping us. Thank you for complimenting the, the, your peer, but do more. So I'll kind of hit them offline if I see a lot of those. And then also, I may just, this is kind of the devil's advocate, or this is kind of extending it myself. Okay, that's a great point. Have you thought about this? Or could you think about that? Or why is this? So I'll try and ask them a question to get them to extend the point down to it themselves. So let's talk about some student behaviors. I'm sure you've all seen this. So the invisible person, all right, tries to hide. I keep trying to sign. There's no way for you to hide. Within two weeks, I know your discussion pattern. By the way, I've been at Lakes anyway, I can see it. So you can't hide, so, but they seem to think they can sit in the last row and figure out how to do that. Well, that doesn't work in discussions. You got the Jane come lately that posts furiously on Thursday and Friday. All right, well, that's great, but that doesn't help us. So I'll go back and say, okay, that's good for this week, but try and get in earlier. So again, you gotta look for these behaviors. You got the devil's advocate, which is good, but then they can be really annoying too. All right, gets too far. The contrarian just likes to argue every single point. All right, I'll tell you which ones I think are the most, most challenging in the course. I talked about these, we talked about this one. The dominator is actually the worst in the class in my mind. This is a real tough one because they're very engaged, they're really intense, they're really excited to be there, but they're posting 30 times. And so two things happen. Everyone else kind of backs off and they're going to burn out. So this one you got to be a little careful because you don't want to damper the enthusiasm, but you want to go, okay, slow down a little bit. This is only week four. We've got 11 more weeks to go here. What I try and do in this case is I try and have a live conversation with them so I can kind of soften the feedback a little bit, saying, look, you're great, you know, but 20 postings is still like A. You're, you're like way past A. 20 is an A. You can, you can cut it back a little bit and be okay. That doesn't always work. Sometimes that's personality-based, but they're actually the bigger challenge because they become so dominant it takes over. And then the contrarian, the one that just likes to argue. And then the therapy seeker. I don't think I have a class that this, this doesn't happen every single class. Well, they'll bring a personal situation in. I say, okay, that's off limits. Psh, take that offline. Or they'll hate their job, they hate their boss, and they use actual names. Okay, look, if you're going to complain about your company, please don't use the name. You know, we do have privacy and we do have you know, public disclosure stuff here. So that one I have to watch a lot because that could get you in trouble. All right? And inevitably, I'll find somebody to bring some kind of personal situation that's not the professional side, it's the personal side into the discussion. So I always I keep an eye on that. That's another problem. If, you're, if you miss a day as an instructor, that might be in the 40 postings and you only read 30 of them, and guess what? The other 10 is one of these postings and you didn't see it. And the next day you get in, all of a sudden this thing blew up on you. So where the hell did this happen? I missed it because you, you missed that tangent. And unfortunately, it's magnetic. Students love that. So they'll all respond to that one. And then they'll share their personal life. Oh, I had that happen to me too. And then you've lost control. All right, so you got to watch that one. That one's happened quite a bit. Any surprises here? I'm sure you've all seen this, right? Any other ones I didn't highlight? Yes, please. The ones that don't quite get it, um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of in the area, but they're going off on some other right. thing. So that's from a content standpoint, yeah. not just not, not engaged, it's more they just don't get the material, right? Yeah. Yes, usually what I try and do in that case is something like this. 
we're taking a point further, or would you consider this, or have you thought about that? I'll try and gently bring them back together by trying to connect dots for them a little bit. If it gets too out of hand, then you might have to have a one-on-one -on -one with that student, right? The other thing is, you also, I think she said in the, in the lunch session, how you pair people sometimes can make a difference, right? We're not talking about, by the way, I also have group assignments typically in these classes, which is another whole dynamic I didn't want to get into today because you've all been through that, I'm sure. That brings another dynamic. I don't ever let students self-select in an online class. I tell them what teams they're going to be on. And I usually wait to the third or fourth weeks. So I get some personalities. I can see what's doing what. And I'll deliberately try and pair them. That's just my personal preference because it just seems to work better. Yes, ma'am. Two questions I'm using Canvas. Sure. Sure. One, do you ever use the gradebook feedback one-on-one -on -one with the students then? For the yes. Speed SpeedGrader. I love SpeedGrader. So you yes. your comments. So you comment in the thread and in SpeedGrader. Yes. Okay, good. And then, um, the second one, do you ever use the function of must comment, bef must comment before you can no. read other people's no. writing? That's deliberate on my part because I want everyone to jump in. And so I always, I always un un uncheck that one, if you will. Uh, yes. Just another Canvas follow-up. So um, have you ever used or tried or do you like having Canvas read it to you? I don't. I've not tried it, so I don't know. Okay. It's interesting. So I am gonna, what I am going to do is I was in VoiceThread earlier today. I'm definitely going to use VoiceThread. I'm going to use that for my summer course. I, I think that's got all kinds. I didn't realize how powerful it was until I saw it today. So that's, just, that's not related to what you said, but you just got me thinking it. about it when you said it. Well, <laughs> I want to try it. You can, you can tell me why. So, so the reason you Jen, don't... Jen, obviously, Yeah, please. The reason you don't make people post before they start is just to... You'd, you'd rather take the onslaught of... Yes. I want everyone first. engaged. I don't want to put any impediment to engagement. Get in. Even now, if that first round is going to be... It's going to be kind of over the place, but then it puts emphasis on us to facilitate a little bit. So again, I'm, I know I'm creating work for faculty, so you're going to have a hard time selling this, I'm sure. Because... Yeah, I, I, uh, know, I mean, it also puts a different kind of work on the students. So I, I, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm getting them... I'm getting, I'm getting them to own the fact I've got to jump in. I'm not... I'm, I'm removing... You being able to control that, not the student's requirement. Yes. That's just a personal just a preference. Approach. Yeah, that's all. Absolutely. But I'm just making sure there's no impediment. There's no excuse why you couldn't have jumped in Monday morning if you wanted to. Um, I'm not in the same position that this gentleman is, but I'm wondering when you're selling it to faculty, what is the difference in like time you put in teaching this way than in a tr traditional face-to-face -face classroom? Okay, so we don't have hard numbers on this. So I'll give you a little bit anecdotal. Okay. So in that class that I showed you that she's using the one mm -hmm. plus one, she's reporting to me she's averaging an hour a day in the discussions. Okay. Okay, so five, uh, five or six hours a week. For All right? One, for one, one class. I'm in there about 10, 10, 12, depending. A week. A week. So it, just in the discussions. So you're probably, you probably, know, maybe it's 30% more, I mean, anecdotally. Okay. It's not that terrible, really. It's, it probably is you gotta get into a rhythm. Yeah. You know, where you're gonna eat up a lot of time is if you, if you miss a day, then you're gonna spend three hours the next day trying to catch up. Or, you know, I, as I said, I go in morning and night, sometimes lunchtime, and I make it much more palatable. And I'm also used to this now, so I can do it a little more quickly. But it's usually about 30% more. Because that's interesting. It sounds like more, because it isn't like, okay, I'm going to teach class for three hours. I'm going to grade, app, you know, papers or read, right. you know, like blue books or whatever. It's not so structured. It's kind of free form. So I can see where it gives the impression is a lot. Yeah. Of it, it, you have to explain, and we can talk more, but you have to explain what this all means because it right away looks, oh my God. Yeah. I don't know if I call this the invisible man, but uh, the other pattern I get is in, in participation is a student who doesn't understand the value of it. Everyone just posts once and not anything else. Right. Just right. responds to the question or misses it right. completely. Misses, misses, not engaged. Not engaged, yeah. or just throws in one answer. So they get, the they get the weekly feedback that you were below our minimum, yeah. and better maybe read the syllabus, and by the way, you just lost so many points. Do right. you want to lose 15 and weeks of these points? And I get a whole yeah. consistent. Yeah, exactly. one I only got five minutes, right? A little less? Yeah. All right, so let me just show you this, because I did that. Uh, I made one slide, a few more questions. So to the point was just asked also, we have a lot of roles here, right? So facilitator is probably the biggest one, but we're also kind of the boundary setter. You know, what's accepted, what's not accepted, what's min you know, what's expected, what's not expected, kind of the frame. We're also kind of the traffic flow, and it goes, you can argue a little bit about uh, facilitator, but I, I say traffic, that's more on a student by student level, facilitator more on the discussion level. So okay, you didn't do enough, 
you're doing a little too much. We need to regulate that a little bit. And obviously, you got to make it. I should have said this up front. I'm sure everyone knows this. It's got to be a positive experience. It's got to be a positive tone in it. You know, because so, you, you got to make them want to do this. All right. So it's obviously going to be there. So I think you can see this already. So, yes, sir. This is good. So within your feedback, I, I mean, you probably don't have numbers on this, but what do you think your um, amount of, I guess, for lack of a better positive feedback is? Yeah. On great, this model? Great point. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, you know, perfect. Well, this is exactly what I'd like to see. You know, well, I'm giving that feedback to the students, or are they giving it to each other? Where you're getting. Oh, I'd say probably 70%. You know, not, not week one and two, like week three and four, because they get used to the model. And then, but I, you know, I've also been teaching this, so a lot of students know this class already at Rutgers from me, so they know what they're getting because word of mouth, you know, spreads a little bit, but it's not bad. And they also say, they do a little bit of self-regulation, they do a little peer pressure a little bit. That goes on too, like it goes on in every workplace, right? Yeah, so it seems to me that you're more engaged in this course because oh, yeah. you don't know necessarily what's going to happen. So right. when you're going in, you're curious about what's unfolding. So can yeah. you talk about it from the instructor's point sure. of view? Sure, and then to your two problems you have arguing. I teach the same courses online. It's like, for example, the course I'm teaching now is the third time I taught at Rutgers. I don't remember what I most in the last class. I don't cut and paste and save my discussion responses. I look at every course fresh. Now that's a lot more work on me, same on me. But the reason I do that because every class has got a different personality, different dynamic, and I try to react to the meat to what's happening right now. So yes, it does require more work, but that's a deliberate decision. Now there's nothing wrong with cut and paste and a few things from other classes. It's efficient. I just don't do it. It's just my personal preference. Playing devil's advocate, how many uh, courses do you teach per semester? So I teach usually three, and at least one online. Like right now, I'm doing two online. Two online ones. Yeah. Yes. So yes, it's crazy. It's way too much work. So I would definitely recommend if you can use this model, one course at a time. I've been doing it for 15 years, so I'm a little used to it now. And I've taught both these classes before, so I, I understand the pattern. But that's not a smart thing. You know, to do both, it's definitely not good. Yes, sir. I would say some of the, the problem, if we call it a problem, that, that I was talking about, one of the challenges that, that Jen and I have, have encountered, um, has less to do with this being a lot of work, but I think the fact that it takes place online in an LMS and it's a piece of technology has a slick interface and the association with things like that is that it's going to streamline or make simpler some aspect of our lives, but that's not at all true of learning management systems. It's not going to be any easier or less time, but there's that overwhelming perception that it should because it's a piece of technology. Yeah, so only neophytes and team experience know that and ever take that position. We all know as faculty, this is a lot more work than teaching on campus. The average student does twice as much work in online classes on campus. There's plenty of research on that. But the argument is a trade-off, right? You do it for convenience, three in the morning versus, you know, whatever. So yeah, there's, there's no way that we can argue these are life for life from a workload standpoint. I'd much rather teach on campus because I was worried about time management. Have you won someone over them? Like, oh, yeah. yeah. And the reason we win them over is we show them the anecdotal information, we show them the student comp, and by the way, the SERS evaluations are pretty high. We're running between 4.5 and 5.0 on all our dialogue intensive classes. So it's not just my classes. I mean, anyone who uses model, we're averaging those ratings. So here's the evidence, faculty. You decide. Yes, sir. Uh, just for the discussion to facilitate that, uh, facilitate that, do you use um, Canvas discussion? So yes. Using the LMS discussion. Yes. Okay. So um, my company uh, sells a social learning platform. We're actually partnered with Canvas. So a lot of the issues you guys have brought up is something that. What's uh, the name of it? Yellow Day. Okay, I didn't so see. So we're with 40 universities like uh, like Harvard, Northwestern, and we're talking about piloting here at Rutgers. And what it does is the instructor goes and sets the parameters of their platform. It looks very similar to like a Facebook type. Uh, sets those parameters so the instructor saves time and the grading and everything. It um, okay. feeds back if you have a MS grade book. So if you get it sold to Yuckers, I'm sorry, Yuckers, sorry, Bruckers, yeah, <laughs> we could look at it. Good. What's the yeah. name of the product? Yellow Dig. Like Yellow Dig? Like D-I-G? Yeah, D-I-G, okay. yeah. So I have 30 seconds left. Any other questions? I'm happy to stay outside. Now I appreciate the time. Thank you, everybody.